Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the um, webinar tonight of uh, Can a Voice to Parliament Help uh, Cancer Outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples? My name is Professor Grant MacArthur, and I'm uh, the Executive Director of the VCCC Alliance, and real uh, delight and honour uh, to be chairing uh, tonight's uh, panel discussion, which I think you're going to find is, uh, is a very engaging um, indeed. So uh, the Voice to Parliament and Cancer uh, panel is hosted by the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre Alliance, the VCCC Alliance, uh, Cancer Council Victoria, CCB, and the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, uh, VACHO. Um, so we get, we've got a lot of CCs tonight with uh, Comprehensive Cancer Centres, Cancer Council and Community Controlled. Uh, the other CC uh, this evening, and um, and we're here to uh, to uh, to discuss a incredibly important uh, issue facing our nation uh, at this point in time. So I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands at which we are all present, uh, the unceded lands of our First Nations people. And I'd like to pay my respect to uh, elders past and present, um, to uh, elders with us this evening and all First Nations people and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us uh, for this uh, webinar uh, this evening. So uh, this is, as I've said, an incredibly important time for our nation. In fact, in Australian history, because we're coming together uh, to make a decision about whether or not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, should have a voice in matters that are very important to them. So the discussion today focuses on the voice to parliament and particularly the impact that that can have in our work in the cancer sector. So we need to understand the voice to parliament and how it may aid in improving cancer outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our nation. So it's important to note that the discussions this evening um, around um, the, the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is really embedded in our colonial history. So for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the discussions associated with the impact of colonisation are really a part of the lived realities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So this is really a moral imperative for um, Australia's First Nations peoples, and indeed, in my view, for the whole country. So it's a brave discussion. It's not easy to have, um, and... You know, it means so much to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, at, at this point in time leading into this referendum. And, you know, we're all privileged to be able to share our thoughts with you this evening. Now, I want this very much to be a very safe and respectful uh, session. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to put questions in uh, through the Q&A function, and we'll get to that uh, on the slides. And I want to acknowledge and recognise that uh, the discussion tonight may raise some difficult emotions for uh, uh, many people engaging in this uh, webinar. And uh, I want to draw your attention on this slide to uh, where people can turn to for assistance. The Yarning Safe and Strong, eSafety Commission, uh, One Three Yarn, well mob and Call It Out, all services that you can access uh, uh, if you wish. So we're going to hear from, um, uh, from each of our panellists. And as I mentioned, uh, you, you'll be able to put questions into the Q&A if we could go to the next slide. Thanks for the, for the Q&A. So use your Q&A function on the webinar and feel free to share um, with others access to the webinar this evening via the VCCC Alliance uh, uh, Centre for Cancer Education. And you can use the QR code you can see on your screen now to uh, access that site and everything is being recorded and will be accessible on that site. Now, without further ado, 
I'd like um, each of our wonderful panelists this evening to introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Todd Harper. Hi, Grant, thank you. Uh, Todd Harper, CEO of the Cancer Council Victoria. And uh, Colleen Kelly. Hello, uh, my name's Colleen Kelly. I'm a Nunagadi Willingu woman from the Amity Nation in uh, Western Australia. Uh, my connections are to Cameron's Paper Talks and Kirk Cups in the Geraldton area. Um, yeah, I wear a few hats, but I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, when I present, if that's all right. And Auntie Gina Bundle. Hello, I'm um, Walbunga Jurinja woman from the east coast of um, Australia and from Ewan country. Um, I also wear two hats. I'm here today as um, consumer rep, and also I work for the Royal Women's Hospital. Thanks, Auntie Gina. And uh, Abe uh, Robertini. Thank you, Grant, and thank you to um, colleagues that are on the panel as well. My name is Abe Robertini, and I'm a very proud Indigenous man. Um, I'm a Māori from the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, and my ancestral links into Australia are through the Palawa mob, the northeast of Tasmania, uh, the Trulloi mob down there. Um, I also wear a couple of hats. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Population Health at the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, or VACHO, uh, and I'm a researcher in the field of medical anthropology, looking at the links between culture and health. Thanks very much, Abe. And um, for this evening, Abe's going to uh, kick things off for us by uh, covering some of the um, statistics and, and the facts as to uh, cancer in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thanks, Abe. Thank you. There are a number of ways in which researchers and cancer services have really interrogated that, and they have tried to come up with ways of understanding how to improve treatment and how to develop new therapies that are particularly focused on uh, closing this gap. But the reality is that we haven't made much progress. And one of the reasons why we haven't made much progress in closing the gap is because of the things that are currently unknown or that we don't know enough about. And what that is, is the gap in trust that exists between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the health system that is there to provide services to prevent and treat cancer. And that gap in trust comes from the history that you mentioned, Grant. The fact that this is a colonized country and that the history that is embedded within that story is one that resulted in intergenerational trauma and intergenerational distrust between Aboriginal people and the health services that are there to provide services that are meant to be equitable, but which are not. And in cancer, what that means is that the cancers that we are detecting within Aboriginal communities, we are detecting far too late. And because we're detecting them far too late, we don't have as many options when it comes to providing treatment and therapy that is gonna be effective and that's gonna prevent the loss of life. And as a result of that, communities are enduring a lot more sorry business than what is really needed. And there isn't an Aboriginal community controlled organization across this country that has not had its flag flying at half mast over the last week or so because of a loss of life as a result of cancer. And that gap in trust is what we do not have data on. And we do not have data on it because we are not measuring the right things and from the right perspective. And the right perspective that I'm referring to here is from the perspective of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves. We are very good at asking questions from the perspective of the health system in asking Aboriginal people, why are your health outcomes so much worse than the rest of the population? There's something that has been asked and answered a hundred times but we're not very good at asking questions from the perspective of Aboriginal communities of the health system. For example, why in 2023 do Indigenous people have such limited choice when it comes to access to culturally safe health services that are delivered in a high trust environment that are there for us in the times that we need them and that can communicate in ways that are effective 
at building understanding and trust in the people who are delivering critical life-saving messages and in ways that engender the, the desire to continue engaging with services without feeling that you're being exposed to ignorance or prejudice or just a lack of understanding about your life experience. The only place that we really see this done well is in with Aboriginal community controlled health organizations where the services are delivered by community members and they're not necessarily delivered for the purpose of preventing or healing a disease. They are delivered for the purpose of understanding how best to support someone with really whatever's going on in their lives. And that might be precarious housing, or it might be a disease, or it might also be, uh, you know, things that are going on in the family around um, poverty or food insecurity. It really doesn't matter what it is that you're experiencing. What matters is that you have a place that you can go to which you trust and which knows you and your family and your community and where you feel a sense of belonging walking through the door. So what we have in the Aboriginal community controlled health sector is really precious in terms of its ability to, uh, to prevent disease and its ability to connect people to the services that they need and to really enrich the health journey of community members throughout their entire lives and the lives of their families and communities. We have a model that works and we wanna share that model and we wanna share how that set of equitable outcomes and that trust is developed and fostered with the rest of the health system where we are missing out on so many opportunities to save lives. And the only way that we're really gonna be able to do that is by giving all of our community controlled health services across the country a voice at a national level that we can feed our successes up to to really clearly set the case for the changes that need to be made within mainstream health services so that we can see more capability being de developed within mainstream health services to produce equitable outcomes. We can see more of the lessons from Aboriginal community controlled services being incorporated into mainstream service models. And we can see that data start to shift. So Grant, I suppose in framing the discussion tonight, what I'm really keen to do is not talk about the rates of disease and the fact that they are much higher. We know that. We know that the experience of Aboriginal communities in uh, cancer is, is, not a, is not a happy story. Um, but I'm really keen for us to be able to have a discussion about the fact that within Aboriginal communities, we have the solutions. And what we really need to do is be measuring the right things and be measuring, uh, you know, things like trust, uh, things like equity. Um, but that can really only be done by looking at this challenge from an Indigenous standpoint, by privileging community control and by providing a platform at a national level for these successes to be shared and for that to be translated into advice to the parliament and to the bureaucracy about how to embed some of these solutions more broadly across the entire health system. Thanks, Abe. That's um, you know, absolutely clear. And the message of uh, building trust is so important. I might even you know, go off script a bit here um, and get, get you to explain to the audience how a voice to parliament is going to help build trust because you know it, it's it, you know uh, to me it's it's crystal clear we need that trust so how will the voice help look one of the challenges that we have is that we have a lot of really well meaning bureaucrats who are trying to find solutions that they can put into action within policy settings that flow on to the experiences that people have when they're interacting with health services. But the, the truth is they really don't know how. They don't know how to embed solutions that work and they, they need the input of Aboriginal community control and peak bodies and you know, other organizations that are doing work in the space to tell them what's working and what's not. And the challenge at the moment is that in the absence of a voice, at the federal level, there is no clear way of communicating to the parliament and to the bureaucracy what, what is working and what isn't. And you're relying on a, uh, an, you know, a number of 
disparate ways of getting access to advocate, um, but there isn't really a mechanism that exists at the moment that does it effectively. And so the voice to parliament is going to enable the successes and the lessons that we are seeing every day within community control to actually be articulated to the parliament and to be picked up and then embedded into the policy settings that then flow onto the health system. And there's, as a result of that, we'll see an improvement in adopting new models of care. We'll see an improvement in funding being directed into the right places, in particular into community control. And as a result of that, all of the services that we're currently delivering, which are really constrained by limited funding, really constrained by you know time limits as well. We we tend only to get funded for things you know, that are really good, but in, in terms of them being pilots. And we're also constrained in terms of the infrastructure that is um, needed to be able to provide these services on a, on a larger scale. So a voice to parliament is going to enable solutions that work to be scaled up. And that scale is going to allow the solutions to reach more people and to be able to solve more problems at a community level. And then, you know, we'll see the gap starting to close. So it's through, you know, the, the cascading progress that we'll make and the momentum that we'll get through scaling up the solutions that work. Thanks, Abe. So it's really, you know, very clear, um, you know, where uh, the Victorian Aboriginal uh, Community Controlled Health Organisation stands on the voice. You know, that is, uh, is, is really clear and... And really, for your organisation, I guess this is going to, you know, the voice could really uh, take the great work that you're doing, which is world leading um, in First Nations health, and uh, and then, as you say, scale and amplify, which is uh, which is fantastic. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to hear, um, I'll say a few words as to um, the position of the VCCC Alliance on the voice, and then we'll hear from uh, Todd Harper, CEO of uh, Kent's Council Victoria, on uh, the, the position taken on the voice by the uh, Cancer Council Victoria. So um, myself as Executive Director of the VCCC Alliance, my senior executive and, and all of our independent directors um, uh, strongly believe that the uh, voice referendum to alter the constitution and establish an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament is a critical step in supporting Aboriginal and First Nations led solutions in cancer control. We, we believe in the science and the science is uh, clear that, uh, that self-determination is absolutely critical to uh, improving health outcomes. And this is why uh, we are uh, such strong supporters of The Voice. Something is about to happen nationally in Australia, and, and that is the Prime Minister is going to release the Australian Cancer Plan. And in the Australian Cancer Plan, there'll be um, details of implementation of an optimal care pathway for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with cancer. And, you know, we strongly believe that we need clear um, abilities of, of hearing what is needed for that implementation to work and that the voice to parliament can empower that. So that's why we at the VCCC Alliance, um, the senior executive and our independent directors, you know, strongly believe in uh, supporting, you know, a yes vote in the forthcoming referendum. But I'll turn now to Todd Harper, CEO of Kent's Council Victoria on the uh, CCV's position. Great, thanks Grant. And if I can make some introductory comments. So the position that we took on The Voice was largely influenced by two factors. One, we know that inequity is a significant driver of cancer outcomes, whether it be access to services, incidence, mortality. We see that in a variety of areas where we um, where inequity is a significant influence on those outcomes. The second aspect that was important to us was recognising that healthcare or cancer care in this case is always better when we respect, listen and hear the voices of patients 
of individuals, of consumers, of communities that we are working with. And all of us have had experience with healthcare systems where we haven't felt listened to, we haven't felt heard, and how much that influences the quality of the outcomes that we receive. So we believe that listening and hearing is particularly important in that, in that regard. So with that in mind, the Cancer Council's statement um, on The Voice, which is on our website, it's two sentences, so I'm happy to, to read it here. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people experience higher rates of cancer and are more likely to die from cancer than non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A voice gives the traditional owners of this country a voice to be heard and considered with the aspiration of informing decisions that reduce health disparities and improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that's our statement. And one of the things that it has become you know, one of the, the critical ways that as an organisation we can shape the services that we provide, whether it be prevention in the form of um, an Aboriginal quit line, for example, screening outcomes in bowel cancer or uh, eliminating cervical cancer, supportive care for patients as they go through a cancer experience. Our partnership with Vacho has over the years really helped us as an organisation to be much more effective in delivering programs to uh, address some of the barriers that uh, I think can only be revealed. We've talked a little bit about trust when there is that basis of trust in a relationship to reveal and inform uh, the uh, decisions and issues that as, as organisations we're all make, making to address the inequities that we see in cancer outcomes. So that's very much, um, Grant, this, the types of principles that are informing uh, our approach here. You know, I, I reflect on some of the successes that we've seen in one of the, the more pressing problems over the years, which was um, uh, Aboriginal smoking. And really it took that partnership approach with the Aboriginal community to help really start to unlock some of the gains that we've seen. And we can see that across the, the spectrum, I think, of uh, services that as an organisation we provide. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Todd. So we have clear clear positions from uh, the three uh, health organisations um, on the voice department. But now what we're going to do is get into some more details from our uh, fantastic, uh, uh, talented and knowledgeable panel. And so... Um, uh, first uh, speaker on our panel to get into some further details will be Colleen Kelly, who's going to talk about the potential for the voice to change health and wellbeing outcomes. Look forward to what you've got to say, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you very much. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the custodians of the unceded lands where we gather today. I pay my respects to elders past and present. And as a visitor on these lands, I'm grateful for your hospitality. Thank you. The Wurundjeri peoples, like all our peoples, are carers for country. We've been looking after the health and well-being of our peoples for over 65,000 years. We know best what keeps us well, which is really the gist of what we're talking about tonight. Thank you to Vacho, uh, the Cancer Council Victoria and the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre Alliance, as you say, lots of C's grant, uh, for the invitation to speak tonight to consider how the voice can improve cancer outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Coming together for these sorts of gatherings with common aims and our collective cultural strengths is always a privilege, so thank you. I gave you a little bit of an introduction at the start um, to say that I am a Nanagadi Willanyu woman from uh, WA. And as with all of us, it seems, we do wear lots of hats, but I'm a senior lecturer in the Gukwundrik Indigenous Unit at Monash University Clayton. And I work in the area of Indigenous uh, health equity, which is a very broad term. Um, I haven't got time probably to describe all the things that we do in that space, but we work with the faculty to embed Indigenous perspectives in curricula. We conduct our own research. And uh, one of the uh, most enjoyable parts about our job, we help to ensure that we get as many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health graduates through our system as we possibly can, because we know that uh, Indigenous health professionals in our workforce um, and creating a critical mass in that space is really important. Um, I've got an emergency nursing background and I still do the occasional clinical shift to keep a hand in and keep up with the ever-changing uh, landscape of healthcare. 
Pardon me, juggling my notes. I'm a PhD candidate using an Indigenous research uh, paradigm to look at the experiences of Indigenous health students in Australian universities. And I'm very proud to be the chair of the board of First Peoples Health and Wellbeing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So whilst all these roles are connected in some shape or form to Indigenous health equity, um, I'm actually representing First Peoples Health and Wellbeing tonight and uh, stand in solidarity with the Aboriginal health sector as we head towards the 14th of October and a referendum uh, vote for The Voice. So if you're not familiar with us, uh, First Peoples Health and Wellbeing is a relatively new uh, Aboriginal controlled, community controlled health organisation. And so we offer affordable primary health care services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their families. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong peoples where we deliver health and wellbeing services to First Peoples and their families across Greater Melbourne. And we've got clinics in Thomastown and Frankston. And uh, can I just acknowledge the amazing work of the First Peoples Health and Wellbeing team uh, led by our CEO, Wamba Wamba woman, uh, Corinda Taylor. Um, but when I was first asked to speak tonight, I had a chat with Brooke from VCC, uh, wondering what I could possibly add to the conversation tonight. Um, I'm not an expert in oncology or cancer care, and I'm certainly not an expert in constitutional law. But I went away, as you all know, Brooke, and had a bit of a think. And uh, I ended up thinking, well, I am an Aboriginal woman. I do have a health background and I have seen firsthand professionally and personally the impact of health policy that does not privilege the perspectives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples where our voices are not listened to. So it's not that we don't have a voice. We absolutely do. But our voices are not being listened to. So tonight I'd like to share a few thoughts about how a yes vote resulting in a successful referendum can provide an opportunity for improvement in Aboriginal health outcomes. So as has been mentioned previously tonight, Australian mainstream health services have been founded on colonisation, racism and privilege. Western knowledge systems continue to underpin healthcare and healthcare education in Australia, continuing the impact of uh, colonisation against First Australians. We know that First Peoples, people, sorry, First Nations peoples experience racism in the Australian healthcare system through interpersonal, internalised, and systemic racism. So that prevents, uh, sorry, presents in uh, different ways for mob. But in 19, sorry, 2019, 243,000 Indigenous Australians who did not access mainstream health services when they needed to, 30% indicated this was due to cultural reasons such as discrimination and cultural inappropriateness. The proportion of Indigenous Australians reporting racial discrimination by doctors, nurses and medical staff in the last 12 months has increased from 11% in 2014 to 20% in 2022. So we're not doing any better in that space. In addition, we're more likely to be left off waiting lists for life-saving treatments and organ transplants, more likely to be provided with limited treatment options or given treatment options that are not appropriate or not accessible. We can be victim blamed for illnesses or circumstances that are beyond our control or at worst our health needs are ignored resulting in preventable death. So a successful referendum that gives us first Australians a say in the things that affects them provides a way to de demand equitable, culturally safe, confident, competent and accessible care that respects Indigenous cultural values, strengths and differences and also actively addresses racism and inequity in health systems. The vision of our organisation, First Peoples Health and Wellbeing, shared by many of you here tonight, I'm sure, is to provide healthcare needs that meets Australian First Peoples Health and Wellbeing needs. And the Aboriginal health sector provides an appropriate and successful health strategy because it's aligned with our ways of knowing, being and doing. We know how critical it is to have Aboriginal health in Aboriginal hands. We are part of, accountable to, and responsive to the communities we serve. Achos know their communities and what works best. We know that First Nations Australians are much more likely to access Aboriginal primary healthcare services where there is affordable access to competent, culturally safe and comprehensive services. Five minute medicine based on a biomedical model of health doesn't work for mob. And I would argue it actually doesn't work for anybody. On the 14th of October, Australians over the age of 18 will be asked to vote in the referendum on whether we choose to change the constitution to recognise First Nations peoples through a voice to parliament. 
we have an historic opportunity to make positive change. It remains ironic to me that the non-Indigenous population of Australia once again get to decide if we are entitled to our basic human rights. We're not asking for anything extravagant or anything that we are not entitled to. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of these uh, points in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but it sets out how universal human rights and fundamental freedoms apply to the distinct experiences of Indigenous peoples. And I won't read all the articles, but it does include the right of Indigenous people to self-determination, to shape their own lives, including their economic, social, cultural and political futures the right to participate in decision-making matters that affect their rights and through representatives that they choose, and determining future priorities to be actively involved in developing and determining health, housing, and other economic and social programs. So the United, Declaration, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People specifically requires that governments around the world in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous people take appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of this declaration. And Australia actually endorsed these recommendations in 2009. A majority yes vote resulting in a successful recommend, uh, referendum will enable true self-determination for, for Australian First Nations communities. And it has an impact at every level for our patients, for our staff, for our families, and for our organisations. And as I mentioned earlier, with regard to the delivery of healthcare, self-determination means we can move away from the deficit models of mainstream healthcare that pathologises First Nations peoples as the problem and provide care instead that sees our strength, our capabilities, and our power. We can be actively involved in developing and determining health and other social programs affecting us to benefit us. We can right the inequity of inadequate and unfair funding models that don't recognise our health needs. We can be acknowledged for the outstanding health outcomes achieved with and for our communities by the Aboriginal health sector. We can work towards increasing the capacity and collective strengths of our health sector. And importantly, mainstream health services can be made accountable to provide culturally safe care and work respectfully with Aboriginal controlled community health organisations. So in short, a yes vote is going to save lives. The voice proposal came out of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a consensus that involved thousands of First Nations peoples from hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across our countries. It came from the most extensive, well-informed and well-formulated dialogues that we've ever had. It's the accumulation of a decade of consultation and the result of the struggle of many generations before. The Uluru Statement from the Heart, the invitation to accept our voices written to the Australian people, a gift and an offering of unity. And this nation building opportunity is not a government intervention. It's a way to make positive change for the health and wellbeing of First Australians. So just in summary, a yes vote will improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. A yes vote will further self-determination. It will enable us to deliver care that we know fully meets the needs of our peoples, holistic care that wraps around patients, their families, and ensures they, ensures they are heard, they are seen, and they feel valued. A yes vote will compel mainstream health services to provide culturally appropriate environments for staff, patients, and their families. And a yes vote will ensure the Aboriginal community sector continues to lead strength-based, solution-focused conversations about how to be responsive to the health needs of our communities. A yes vote benefits all Australians. Mm -hmm. But just in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the work of everyone here tonight who contributes to keep, uh, keeping our communities safe and strong. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colleen. Um, incredibly clear and powerful um, exposition there you know I feel like I want every Australian to hear what you just had to say it's just uh, um, so it gives us all a sense of direction I think okay let's move on now to on our panel to uh, Auntie Gina Bundle and uh, Auntie uh, Gina will speak to us uh, from a consumer and Aboriginal health unit perspective thanks Auntie Gina. thank you yeah. thank you um I'd like to start by also acknowledging um, the, the lands that we're on, the, the Wurundjeri and Boon countries of the Kulin Nation. Um, my story is actually um, probably what this is all about. Um, in my family of nine siblings, including myself, 
four have passed from cancers, two when they were young, one from an accident, and now there's only two of us left. And I look back at that and I think, what do we have to do to stop that? Aboriginal families are touched by cancer in record numbers now, more than ever before. And what we need, I mean, we hear people talking about all the, all the money that Aboriginal people supposedly get. And I think, well, where is that money? Because we don't see it. You know, in an anecdotal type thing, just for me in the perspective of we may see $50 out of 1000 because that money doesn't get to the ground. And so I want to know where the money is so that my people don't keep dying of cancer. I don't want to die of cancer. You know, I screen, I go crazy screening because, you know, thank goodness we can now. And so those sorts of things are really, really important that Aboriginal people have access to health in all sorts of areas because all sorts of areas contribute to the health of Aboriginal people. Housing, education, drugs and alcohol, education and services and facilities, the stolen generation, the, the, the prisons, you know, all of those things cause stresses in people's bodies that allow things to happen. And Aboriginal people live those stresses every day. And so, you know, we need to be seeing where that money is and bringing it back to community so that we could rectify those stresses. Because I think we have the key and we do have the solutions to create better housing, better education, better health services, um, better services for drugs and alcohol, you know, rehabilitation to make people well um, and give them options, employment. You know, if all the money that we said we'd supposedly get, we could buy a house for everybody. We could pay everybody a wage that they wouldn't have to jump through hoops to get Centrelink payments and then get cut off. And so, you know, all of that money supposedly could fix it all but we don't see it. We actually don't get that money. And it's a real divide in community that non-Aboriginal people think we get that money. We don't. Um, otherwise I'd have a house and a car and all sorts of things. But, you know, but it's a real serious issue that there is the solutions are there and we know what the solutions are and we need the money and the help and the infrastructure to, to, to create better solutions to the problems that we have because we've had the problems for a while closing the gap's been around for a while and all sorts of reports investigations deaths in custodies all of the the recommendations even that came out of all of those things the majority of those recommendations were never implemented lots of money was spent on them but Aboriginal people didn't see that money. Aboriginal people didn't benefit from that money. And so, you know, and for me to do my little bit, I get on um, Reconciliation Cultural Council, um, Stolen Generations Reparations Committee, um, VACL board members for languages. And, you know, because culture plays a really important role in keeping people well. And so we need those things. Hardly any money is, sp is spent on languages, and language is an identity. It's, it's Aboriginal people's identity and to the reclaiming of culture and practice, of art, song, dance, all the song lines and storytellings that, that used to be. We were never, weren't allowed. We had to be, you know, stop doing that. Stop speaking your truth. Stop speaking your language. You know, that's what made us ill. And we need to be able to reclaim that back and go some ways to recreating the, the health in our bodies and our families and in our communities, because then the country will be well also, you know, because it's really important because land is important to Aboriginal people. It's important to the health of Aboriginal people. And lots of organisations get money for environmental purposes, but Aboriginal people don't.
And so the, the most thing that, that, that's most important to Aboriginal people is the land and their culture and culture in all sorts of ways, in arts, song, dance, storylines, song lines. Um, it's really important that we're able to reclaim those practices back because I don't want to be the next one in my family to die of cancer or any other illness. Um, and I don't want to lose any more people that I know that are close to me who I've lost already. I don't want to lose any more of them either. And so... I think a voice to parliament would firstly be there. It'll take a lot to get rid of it because we've had voices, but the government will be able to say, well, we don't want you anymore. We don't want to listen to that. It's not working for us, so we don't want that. Not working for them, I should say. Um, and I think this, this will enable a voice that can't easily be gotten rid of. And because sometimes we need a big stick there to say, hang on a minute, you need to not do doing things that way because it doesn't work for us. And so if we get that, I think that would be a wonderful thing. And because it's for the generations to come, not just me, I'm 60 next year and I won't be around for much longer, but I hope not. But, you know, I really think that the future and, the, and our young ones are the ones that are going to benefit the most from this. And I think we as people in this moment in time have a right to do the right thing for them. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Gina. Um, I also wish that every Australian could hear what you just had to say as well, because I think um, you can't help but reach into your heart uh, from the words that you've shared and the ideas you've shared with us this evening to uh, really for everyone to come together to make a difference for, for the challenges, both social and health. Auntie Jeannie, you've re reminded us of. Okay, so um, thank you so much. And now um, I'll hand back to Abe uh, Robertini. You know, we've heard a lot about self-determination and we want to just dive in a bit deeper into self-determination and why it is so important and, and you know, how the voice will assist with self-determination to give better health outcomes. Thanks, Abe. I think, you know, we've... We, we hear a lot of these terms used and it's important to really get to their meaning so that they're not just abstract concepts because self-determination is so critical for anybody when it comes to health. Having the agency to choose for yourself what pathway is the most appropriate and having a genuine choice when it comes to being able to determine what pathway is appropriate for you is critical. And the challenge that we have at the moment is that we have health services that were not designed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in mind. And as a result of that, they have not been designed for the purpose of achieving outcomes that are specific to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So the result is that Aboriginal communities don't have a choice a lot of the time to access appropriate care pathways that are specific to the, what their needs are. The options that are available are generally designed for the non-Aboriginal population. And as a result of that, they tend not to work at the level of individuals, families, and communities. And they tend not to be adjusted for the fact that there is a deficit in trust between Aboriginal people and health services. And so we, at the moment, are faced with really limited choice when it comes to getting culturally appropriate, culturally safe services. So that the ability to self-determine, what it means in practice is the ability to create an alternative and to create and maintain an alternative that is genuinely designed for your needs and which is capable of achieving your outcomes as you articulate what your needs are and what your outcomes are. So the reason why this is critically important to understand is because, let's take an example. If you are born in this country today in a Greek family 
or an Italian family or an East Asian family or a South Asian family or even a white Australian family, you are just saturated in culture from day one. You're born, your family picks you up, looks at this beautiful little baby and just starts doing things, which you've done for generations and generations, which tell you as a new member of this family and of this community, who you are. Says, this is who you are. This is where you belong. This is your family. They will be there for your entire life. They are there for you to protect you, care for you, give you whatever you need. They will give you life. They will introduce you to this place that you belong, where you will develop an affinity and a sense of belonging in. And they will be there for you throughout stages of your life where you will become a person and you will become a, uh, your own self-determined uh, and, uh, and, you know, a, a person who is capable of achieving all of your potential, right? And for a Greek or Italian person that may be practiced through the cooking of your nonna or your yaya or, you know, Greek Easter or going to church and, um, you know, being able to, um, yes, being able to speak your language and being able to do, you know, all of the things that are critically important to who you are and to your ability to feel that sense of belonging and have your identity affirmed, right? That is a critical underlying determinant of whether you are well, whole, whole of person, holistically well, and whether your family is well, right? Whether your grandparents are living long enough to meet your children, right? And to show you and pass on knowledge to you that was important to them, right? And whether they can tell you about the places that you can trace your ancestry back to and whether they can share with you knowledge about what has traditionally been important to you and your people for generations, right? What we have to understand and the reason why we need to take action to establish a voice to parliament and constitutional recognition is because that was the thing that was stolen from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. It was that underlying cultural enabler of health and well-being, that automatic pre-existing wraparound of culture, of community, of identity and belonging, which was systematically, systematically disestablished, right? Not entirely, not entirely. But it was very effective at doing a lot of damage to those enablers of health and well-being for an entire people. And healing starts by allowing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be in the driver's seat of articulating what that cultural enabler of health is, how we rebuild it, how we replenish that source of life, how we revive the languages, and ultimately how we design those services which are specifically responsive to the people who are alive today, who are living with the consequences of that intergenerational trauma that has been caused over the last 200 and something years since this process began. So in practice, self-determination and health is Aboriginal community control, is a strong Aboriginal voice that is able to articulate what we're talking about tonight, right? From the perspective of indigenous people and which is able to speak directly to the people who have political power and who have the ability to configure the policy settings that enable or disable these solutions that work. By way of example, we're already doing this, by the way, it's just that it's constrained by inappropriate policy settings that are not being responsive to these solutions. But we have in Victoria, in breast cancer screening, been able to mobilize enormous, enormous engagement from communities across the state, purely by embedding culture in the process of having breast screens done. 
right? So each Aboriginal community across this state has been invited to design a shawl which can wrap around a woman as she is going in for a breast screen. And that shawl is designed with artwork from an artist from that local mob. And they can wear that as they go in and they have their breast screen done and then they can keep it, it goes away with them. This is a literal wrapping around of culture, which is life affirming and identity affirming and which, which mobilizes such energy around the reason why we screen. And it's exactly what Art was saying, that we screen so that we can be there for those future generations. And the result of that so simple, simple initiative, right, has meant that we have been able, within the last two weeks, we've screened 600 women across the state, right, through an incredible partnership with Breast Screen Victoria, right, but an Aboriginal-led solution which has mobilised such engagement purely because it has been designed to embed culture, because we know that that's what gets people engaged and what really gets people um, coming out to participate in in uh, health services because it's been designed for them. Similarly, within the prevention and elimination of cervical cancer, we're making huge progress because we have been able to have a voice at the table around the elimination strategy for cervical cancer. And we've been able to design culturally specific pathways for people to undertake a screening, which is detecting cancer earlier. And so it's not just that we're asking for something which is an experiment or which has been, you know, not tried. We're already doing it. We're already designing solutions that are more appropriate and that are more responsive to the specific needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The challenge at the moment is that we might get a little bit of funding to try it as an innovation or to try it as a pilot. And we might get an incredibly successful evaluation outcome, but that funding is at the whim of the government of the day. And the continuity of the programs is always under threat. And the overall effectiveness of these programs, though proven, is constrained because they are not allowed to scale and they're not allowed to grow. Because at the end of the day, we still have that challenge that we spoke about at the very beginning of this evening around what is valued, what perspectives prevail, and, and ultimately what data we are collecting. And so shifting that perspective through a voice to parliament is really critical for privileging these perspectives and for, and for changing these outcomes by empowering these models that we know work. Thanks very much, Abe. They, um, what uh, just incredibly fantastic examples there of self-determination in the cancer space with the cervical cancer screening and the beautiful shawl pro project that's having such uh, impact um and you know that they are such clear example success stories to me that uh, that everyone should uh, uh, learn from and uh, as we think about other key ways that self-determination can make a, a difference and uh, um all right let's move to let's move to our uh, panel discussion now and uh, and the um um, you can all those joining us in the webinar put your questions in the in the Q and A, um, and uh, we'll we'll uh, uh, do our very best to to get to your questions. Um, but I might just kick off the discussion a little bit about what the voice is. Okay, so um, so you know what um, can it do and what it can't it do to to uh, make a difference to health and well-being for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Colleen, do you want to have a crack at, at, at that to start with? And then uh, I hope yeah. you're going to ask me first. Um, I think for me, it's probably what I've tried to articulate in what I said tonight. So it is this aspect of self-determination and agreeing with what Abe and Aunt have said this evening, it's we know how to care for mob. You know, this, these are not new revelations to us. It's just we've been obstructed through, as Abe was saying, systems that don't enable us to do that in the best way possible in ways that make sense to us. So to me, the voice is about representation for diversity of mob as well. One hat does not fit all 
Um, I'm Yamaji from across across the way. You know, we live in urban environments here, Wurundjeri, Bunurong, etc. So, the concerns uh, for mob in different spaces is different. So, therefore, you know, the solutions will necessarily be different. And I was listening to Noel Pearson today, um, talking about exactly that. And he was talking about an example. He was up north somewhere and sitting with community out under mango trees, just having a yarn about, you know, what, what they thought was going to work in their community. And so what they were discussing up there will be absolutely right as a solution for that community, may not work down here in urban Melbourne. So I think it's a few things. I think it's about having diverse needs met. It is that seat at the table. Um, it's what Aunt and Abe were talking about in terms of funding that uh, gets absorbed into mainstream health care services under the guise of being given to Aboriginal health and it often does not get to those spaces. So um, yeah, they're the sorts of things that just come to mind. The other thing I guess, particularly from the space that I'm involved in uh, with regard to uh, embedding the perspectives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is this notion of cultural safety. And um, we spend a lot of time, as I said, in curricula trying to introduce things. Um, the pedagogy of our unit in particular is around critical self-reflection and anti-racism. And we're hoping that Monash um, health graduates, for example, come out as health practitioners with that awareness before they, before they go into their, uh, before they're dealing with, um, with mob in, in those spaces. So, yeah. Uh, they're the sorts of things and making our health facilities accountable. So reconciliations will, you know, they'll say this happens and that happens. But as I said, some of those statistics say that's not translating. So mm. an accountability for those sorts of things as well. Thank you. And I certainly um, uh, terrific work in thinking about cultural safety and racism. You know, I, when I trained in medicine, you know, I had no um, education and teaching from First Nations people about culture at all. It was zero, um, which is a, a travesty, so important work. Um, just sticking on, you know, what the, the voice is and what it can do, why does it need to be in the Constitution? Abe, you want to tackle that one? I think the first thing to say is that this is the part of it that's not controversial. That part of it has bipartisan support. So constitutional recognition is something that all parties in the current parliament have said they are fully supportive of. Uh, I think that uh, it needs to be in the constitution because, you know, what I was saying before about what has happened in this country and about the the harm that has been caused through our colonization. I don't think there is a single measure that any government can take that can heal all of the, the hurt and the pain and the damage that has been caused. But sometimes mattering helps. Being recognised helps. The acknowledgement helps. It is an essential part of that healing journey. And it's what's owed because of the harm that has been caused and because the omission of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from the founding document of the modern Australia was such an error that we all agree with, right? So there's a moral and in principle reason why it's critically important that constitutional recognition is achieved. And I think that it will be achieved it would just be so much, so much easier for it to be achieved on October the 14th when we all vote. And I have faith that it will be. There's also the practical reason as well, that uh, as Aunt said, we've had voices before in different ways, shapes and forms, and they have been disestablished with the stroke of a pen. You know, I think that um, uh, at a whim of uh, a government, if, uh, what a voice is saying is inconvenient or is, you know, not welcome by the government of the day, then it can be disestablished. And I think we're beyond that now. I think that we are a grown up and mature nation that is ready to hear what the Uluru Statement from the Heart says and to accept that invitation and to enshrine it in the constitution so that it can't be removed at a whim of a 
of a government of the day. It should be an enduring recognition and it should be an enduring voice to parliament that is established. Thanks, Abe. That, uh, at least to me, that is um, uh, absolute reason it needs to be in the uh, constitution because of the history, right, of other bodies, you know, being dissolved, um, even when they were effective. Um, and there's been some very good commentary on on successes that have been uh, pushed aside. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so, I want to move to you know, what I think is difficult and one um, I'm sure we all feel somewhat emotional about this, but what would a no vote mean? You know, what were those listening this evening and watching the webinar and replay, what would a no vote mean and what can um, people talk about out around our nation? Um, as to really what the consequences would mean of a no vote. Who'd like to take that one? How do you feel about it, Auntie Gina, if there was a no vote? Do you know, we've, in this moment, it's, it's a moment in time that's really important. And I did work with the Treaty Commission um, with Auntie Jill Gallagher um, doing the road shows and we created the, the Treaty Possum Skin Cloak. Um, which I like to call a historical document in its own right mm -hmm. too. And um, and I think that a no vote, even though we're, we're, we're doing treaty and we're going to go forward with treaty, I think a no vote would not give it, the treaties the power that it should have, you know, because we've, we've looked at treaties across the world, here, there and everywhere, and it's a piece of, it's a document, but it's a document that in, in other countries hasn't fully been acknowledged or respected. Mm. And I think our treaties, because we're going to learn a lot from the treaties that have come from around the world, and I think a no vote could may weaken those treaties, because it won't be one treaty, it'll be treaties, because like you were saying, you know, different mobs have different needs. And so I think the yes vote would strengthen treaties um, and a no vote would weaken that. Um, and, of course, you know, looking into the future, I'd like to think that this moment in time we will be able to look back and know that we've done everything that we can to strengthen the opportunities for our young ones into the future. And I think, and I mean, it won't, it may be a no for now, but it won't always be a no. And, you know, because we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop fighting for what we, we believe is our right, um, you know, and we're used to having setbacks, having no's and having disappointments and um, and discrimination, the racism all rolled into one. And, and, you know, goodness, you want to see some of the comments that you see in social media. Um, Australia is still very, very racist. And you read those comments and you think, you know, the yes vote, I believe, would give us protection from that type of behaviour because it's, it's vile, some of the things I've read online, and it's like, how do people actually think like that? And so, you know, it would be a disappointment for me personally if we didn't get up, but it won't be the end of what we're fighting for, you know. Um, and so I'd like to think that we're going to get up. So... Thanks. I might turn uh, and um, uh, comments. Actually, Colleen and Abe, can you comment as well? What do you think it would mean? Yeah, well, I, uh, I agree uh, with Aunt. I guess personally, I will be um, very disappointed. I think that it's um, going to be a bit of a sad reflection on Australia, to be honest. Uh, but as Aunt says, uh, it won't change anything about our day to day business. We get on with our fight. We pour our energies into our ACOs and dealing with our students and, and doing the work that we do in that space. So that's not going to change. Um, sadly, we are used to disappointment. Um, uh, 
But no, I personally will be disappointed. I, I am hopeful for a yes vote. I haven't actually contemplated that at this stage and it's coming together in spaces like this um, with MOB and with our allies, that collective strength that I was talking about, that gives me great heart and great cause for optimism. And um, we've all been pretty busy out and about um, spreading the word and making the commitment, you know, to speak to four people every day and have a yarn about these sorts of things. So I think I think it is these informal conversations. Um, if the worst case scenario happens and it's a no vote, I do take heart that the truth telling process that Europe Commission, we know the recommendations have been handed down for that. I think this growing up of Australia starts with truth telling, the painful truth telling and the truth telling is one thing, but now what are we going to do about that? Um, so maybe it's just one more step that, um, yeah, non-Indigenous Australia is taking baby steps along the way. I don't know, but... Um, yeah, not contemplating a no vote at the moment. I agree. I, yeah, totally agree. I think that uh, uh, I think we will prevail on the fourteenth of October. I think that um, when people are alone in the voting booth, and it is just them and their conscience, that the better nature of Australia that I've seen, that you've seen, that we've all seen, the capability of Australia to really reflect on the country that we want to be will come out and we will see the yes vote prevail. And if it doesn't happen, then on October 15th, we'll get back to work. Abe, I was just going to say too, we know that the young people that have been um, enrolled to vote, like the young, our younger generation, I have every hope in our young people, as you were saying, aunt, you know, yeah. um, maybe this generation are going to be a little bit more difficult to persuade for whatever reason. But um, yeah, so that's what gives me hope. The energy, like most young people I speak to, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike, why on earth are we even considering that it would be anything other than yes? So they're the sorts of things that give me hope. And um, but to the point, yeah. this decision is for our young people. And that's a, our young ones will be the treaty makers. Yeah, well, they're so. deadly. I can tell you the youngsters we deal with out at Monash, old wowsers, yeah. like they are change agents for the future. I'm an old Monash girl. Yeah, are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> well done. And I have to disclose that I'm Monash. Oh, there we go. Very very nice. Nice. Alumni. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> very good. Um, I'd like to turn to Todd now and ask Todd a question. Todd, you've been in cancer control for a, for a long time. So, and the Cancer Council and yourself have thought, you know, a lot about uh, cancer in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So how will a voice do you think as a cancer control expert make a, a, a practical difference to uh, um, health and particularly cancer? So I've seen uh, how governments and parliaments make a difference with cancer. Um, I've seen some of the decisions that have been made. It might be around funding. It might be around creating smoke-free environments. It might be, as Grant, you and I have been involved with, with banning solariums. So I always reflect on how powerful it is when government gets decisions right. Government is such a huge and critical partner in the way that we deliver cancer, prevention, treatment, early detection, palliative care. And when government listens and listens well, they make really good decisions that transform uh, cancer outcomes for generations. That's the power of good decision-making. Good decision-making, whether it's in our own organisations or in government, is so much better when we understand, we listen, we hear the perspectives of those that we are focused on, those whose outcomes we want to make better. So to me, that is, that is how we can see governments, parliaments, making decisions that are better informed and transformational. They are such a critical partner in the way that we deliver cancer in this country. All of us can reflect on some of those good decisions that have been made. So I think that's the power of um, achieving those better outcomes and having a government that is working 
in partnership with those of us working in health, working in cancer, to achieve better outcomes for future generations. Thanks, Todd. Now, um, <clears throat> questions come um, uh, online from um, uh, Professor Jennifer Phillip, who is uh, co-chair of the VCCC Alliance's uh, um, uh, equity program. And um, uh, Jennifer raises a really interesting question, um, and that is um, clearly self-determination is uh, is first and foremost to improve outcomes of First Nations people. But then Jennifer asks, what can um, others in the health sector learn from those self-determination um, uh, driven um, uh, innovations from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Because I, I reckon there's a lot that can be learned. So, um, Auntie Gina, you're in the, what, what do you think you can, you know, you can teach um, non-First Nations um, healthcare oh, I, I think um, everybody that steps into a hospital would benefit by the way we work with our people. Um, and they've all said, lots of people say that um, we we do work differently. You know, we do create atmosphere in a sterile place where people feel at home, people feel protected and taken care of, because um, we we get a little bit um, bit wild when things <laughs> when people aren't doing what they should be doing with um, in 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 the care of our people and. Everybody should have advocates the way we advocate for our people. And, you know, Aboriginal liaison officers um, are in hospitals across the country now and we all carry a huge cultural load in protecting our people that come through our doors. Um, where I am, it's mums and babies, you know, Royal Melbourne's trauma, Cross the Road, Peter Mac, um, you know, it's a cancer service. Um, and as ALO for all of those at one stage, it was a real, um, a, a real team effort from Aboriginal people, but also non-Aboriginal staff. Um, having having allies in place like that, who really, really enjoy the way we work, and then change their way they work, it, it's made such a difference to to how we deal with um, our patients at the at the Royal Women's Hospital, and in some of the areas at our hospital, we're closing the gap. It's only small, but we're closing the gap, you know, and it's not many places can say that across the country, and I'm very proud of that. Hey, what do you think? I mean, this is, you know, I love this question because I think there's so much to learn. Absolutely, and it's a great question, and I um, I, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's so right that it comes from Jennifer because um, such an incredible ally in the work that she's been doing uh, with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are, um, undergoing palliative care and are on the journey to the dreaming and um, the work that um, Jennifer's undertaken in, in prisons as well has, I'm sure, been informed so much by her experience working alongside Aboriginal health workers. Um, I have the privilege in my role at Vacho to work with the 33 Aboriginal community controlled um, organisations that exist across Victoria and being able to visit each of those services and to speak to the doctors who work in those spaces, many of whom are non-Aboriginal non people who were trained in the way that we train all of our doctors and then, uh, you know, come to understand how medicine is practised. And I get to see them walk through the door of an ACHO and discover a new way of practising, which embodies a whole range of other values and principles, which for many of them, enable them to breathe a sigh of relief and to reflect on all of the things that we often don't get right within mainstream settings of care. Because within community controlled settings, it is about atmosphere. It's about deep relational conversations and moments of warmth and caring very deeply about the people who are walking through the door and not just about what they've come to talk to you about, not just about a particular body part and not just about a particular 
chronic disease or acute condition that might be affecting them on that particular day. It's about how they are in themselves and all of the ways in which that can be affected in their lives. And it's about how their family is. And so a lot of the doctors that walk through the door of an at show not having ever worked in Aboriginal health before, they actually never leave. They stay and they, they find their vocational home there because they realize that they can't go back to a model where they're only able to deliver services that you can bill for and where you know everything that you're doing is transactional and where you're forced to work within a model of care that has become so commercialized that you stop seeing the person, their family, and all of the things that are coming through the door with them, which may inform whether they trust you or not. And within an Aboriginal-led model of care, there is an authorizing environment for health professionals to slow down when they recognize that they need to slow down and to spend as much time as possible really understanding the depth of some of the complexities that people are bringing with them into the consulting room. And so there is an enormous amount that can be learned from that. There's really a transformation of our entire health system that can be learned from that. And this is what a lot of people don't realize until they visit an ACO and then they sort of, they have a moment where they kind of don't quite realize the, the gold that, that exists, which is right in front of our faces and which we could all learn from if we could listen more and if we could hear and if it could be given a platform to articulate its real value. We, and we the also, voice specifically, uh, you know, will this open up many avenues for for learning about uh, ways of doing things different across our nation, not just in, not just in health, but maybe in other areas as well. Do you think? Uh, I I think so. They? I yeah. do think so. And yeah. um, and in regards to where I work, you know, um, what what also can change things is, um, and it's terrible, boring stuff, but policy and policy making and all the rules making because we do all sorts of things that aren't just medical. It's a real holistic everything we talk genealogy we do cultural stuff weaving possum skins um we talk all about all sorts of you know song lines um creating ceremony and stuff like that within the hospital itself and so we write policies along those lines that allow us to do that but allows other staff also to do that and so it's i think this the yes vote would actually enhance that would actually give non-Aboriginal organisations the freedom to say, well, actually, we want to work that way. Mm. You know, it, it may allow them to work that way and not be stuck in that very mainstream way of doing things because that doesn't work. It's proven that that doesn't work, um, you know, especially not for us, but it sometimes doesn't work for anyone else either, you know, and it may actually give... Other, uh, other departments of all sorts of persuasions, the freedom to work the way we work. So I think it's, it would be a good thing just for that on its own. Excellent. Now we've got another uh, question online um, from um, uh, Danielle Spence. And um, Danielle asks us, what can the collective cancer community do to drive out racism in healthcare? And um, very timely from Danielle to raise this because that was where I was going to go next to, to to delve into you know racism because there is absolutely huge you know uh, unconscious bias which is ra racist uh, based you know in our health system so yeah what can we what can we do about racism and also how will the voice help maybe I can take that one um, yeah, so um, with respect, I don't actually believe there's anything, any such thing as unconscious bias. I think it's, I think it's bias. Um, but I think we go back to that educational role and, um, you know, you're alluding to a lot of people have come through the Australian education system and what they learnt about Aboriginal people was, you know, Captain Cook was a great fellow and um, Aboriginal, etc. So we we know the narrative, but... 
And I take the point that you don't know what you don't know, but I think at some point we all need to take on an individual personal responsibility for finding out more. And I think that's one benefit actually of what's happening in um, society at the moment. These discuss uh, discussions are bringing these sorts of things to the forefront. So I think education is incredibly important and not just uh, you go and do cultural training for a couple of days. I'm talking about that critical self-reflection. And so we say in our space, actually, with our students, when they're coming to learn or they, you know, there's an Aboriginal lecturer coming in to do whatever, you know, they think they're going to be learning about Aboriginal people and they may learn something about our culture, but actually they're learning about themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Aboriginal people and why? what has influenced what you know about Aboriginal people and get them to understand that sometimes not always what they know has come from this very deficit discourse, which is reflected in the media, um, society, in our hospital systems and actually in our education systems. And this is a little bit off track, but to go back to truth telling, so truth telling on a societal level, but truth telling in our health professions as well. Now, that can be painful, but the the reality is, is that as a nurse, as a doctor, as a whatever, these professions are founded on colonial models of health that saw Aboriginal people as inferior, infirm, etc. And so Florence Nightingale, um, and this will be controversial, sorry to all of, all of you watching this, but the lady with the lamp has a very, very dark history. Um, she was uh, a racist, make no mistake. And I've heard it said, you know, and you probably have too, that Florence Nightingale was a woman of her time, but even her peers um, were, some of them were calling her to account. And not only was she responsible for her own racist views, she influenced political policy in her generation. So that's just one example. And I think if we um, do that truth telling and understand what has influenced how we still teach health and how we still practice health, um, I think they're really important steps forward. So it's all about this critical self-reflection of ourselves as individuals, um, of our health professions, and making sure that the uh, education is not just this passive didactic. It's actually the next, It's that's why we talk about anti-racism. The anti-racism is actually the next step in doing something about it. And it's a challenge for our students because they're young, they get going into these power structures where the norm, unfortunately, is to enforce some of these stereotypes. So it's how do we give them skills to contest um, those sorts of uh, scenarios? Can I add one thing to that as well? I think I totally agree with everything. And there's there's another element to racism as well, which exists at the, the way that systems have been designed. Um, I mentioned earlier that none of our health systems outside of the Aboriginal community controlled settings have been designed with Aboriginal people in mind. Um, but I mean, it's not a radical idea to redesign health services in response to the specific needs of patients that we need to prioritize. I mean, aunt works at the Royal Women's Hospital. <laughs> There's a reason why we have hospitals for women. There's a reason why we have hospitals for children. That right? is because we have recognized that certain people have certain needs that taking a one size fits all approach to gets inequitable outcomes. Right? We recognize that when children are coming into spaces, those spaces need to be designed for children in mind. Right? We recognize that people's lived experience matters when it comes to interacting with health services and then our health services need to be responsive to that. We're asking for no more than that. Okay, We're asking to be heard in putting forward the solutions that will result in those health services that are currently not appropriate to achieving equitable outcomes for Aboriginal people just hearing us out, right? So it's a modest ask in terms of the voice to parliament, but it has enormous power in terms of being able to achieve that equity, which is currently enjoyed by a lot of groups that have had to push those boundaries. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, we didn't have women in medicine, right? That women really had to fight to have a, a way of participating and being heard within the medical professions and within settings of care and in putting forward reasons why their voice mattered, right? This is the next step in advancing equity in health. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I, I, I just want to... Um... For those online, I'm sure you're all very grateful of the wisdom 
I know that we've heard about tonight. Um, we've heard um, from each of our speakers, you know, why a voice to parliament is going to make a real practical difference to the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the rest of our community as well as we spoke about earlier. And there is a sense of confidence and personally for me, you know, I think when people are in that ballot box, people just like in 1967, they'll reach into their hearts and they'll know that they can personally make a difference to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our nation by voting yes. So um, if we could uh, put up once more, please, the uh, social and emotional wellbeing slide, just to remind people that they can access that. You can also access more information on the VCCC Alliance uh, uh, website. Um, and the, uh, this evening's uh, proceedings are all recorded. And so I ask each and every one of you, talk about what you heard tonight. Talk about what a difference the voice can make and um, have the conversations with people close to you. Um, be advocates for yes, if in your heart you think that is the right thing to do. And I uh, just want to um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we all look forward to October 14, a historic day in our nation's history. Thank you.